Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Bricha Makanandesa. I'm from the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment uh, from the section uh, Biodiversity Enforcement. I'm responsible for both administrative and criminal uh, enforcement. Okay, uh, what I do mostly is to issue uh, the directives to non-compliant uh, landowners. As uh, Mr. Itani has indicated that they escalate the, uh, the non-compliances to us. So we check and then um, that's when we issue the directives. And then um, the process is, I can just explain a little bit that after getting the non-compliance, especially when it comes to the listed invasive species plants, um, uh, for what we require from the landowners, uh, we direct them to submit the, the control plans, the invasive species control plans for category 1B uh, species. And then for category 2, we direct uh, the landowners uh, to apply for a permit. And obviously the permit will come with the conditions as uh, Lusanda has explained to you guys. And then I also want to stress the point that um, when we get the, 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 the control plans, it's not something that the landowner can just say, maybe depending on the, on the infestation at the property and the, the, the size of the property, we do give the landowners to clear their land maybe within five years or even eight years. So you find that we had complaints and now the directive has been issued. The complainant is, keeps on asking, what are you doing? And then that person has got five to eight years maybe to clear the land. And then, because these things that involve money, and then depending on the budget of the landowner, then that's when they give us uh, this um, uh, number of years and then we decide whether we can approve or not. So that's what I wanted to stress because it's like people are saying, ah, you are not doing anything about this landowner and whatnot and whatnot. So I hope I am clear on that one. Um, then from there what happens, I'm going to explain as I'm going to be opening, uh, going through the slides. So this is my presentation outline. This is the legislative framework, the background of EIS, regulation, the offenses. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the penalties, the case study, and the condition. Okay. I'm used to walking up and down when I do the presentation because I've been comfortable doing that, but I will try. Okay. And then the conclusion. <laughs> and then the, legis uh, the legislative framework. Where did it all start? It all started with the Constitution of South Africa, Section 24. I think we all know as uh, the environmental people and uh, that everyone has got a right to the environment that is healthy, um, to their well-being. I mean, that is not harmful to their health or well-being and then to have the environment uh, protected for future and present generation through the reasonable legislation uh, measures. And then from there came the National Environmental Management Act. Um, and then after that, the NEMBA animated from NEMA, of which I am responsible for um, implementing the number and then after uh, the number there is specific uh, uh, environmental management uh, act and the regulation which is the okay the number is the specific environmental management act and then animated the alien invasive species uh, regulation which came into effect in 2014 October and they amended it and then yeah Okay, enforcement, uh, the NEMBA and AIS regulations are enforced by the environmental management inspectors, which are also known as uh, the green scorpions. And then 
we are a network of environmental enforcement officials from various spheres of government. You find the EMIs at the national departments, you find them at the provincial uh, departments, and you also find the EMIs at uh, the municipalities. But in this case, uh, for alien and invasive uh, species regulations, only the EMIs from the national department can implement the AIS regulations. They can inspect, they, conduct, they can conduct inspections for AIS. You don't find them from the province saying that um, we are issuing directives for, uh, for AIS. No. Okay. And then the EMS work closely with the SAPS in, environment, in investigating the environmental crimes. What are the functions of EMIs? We monitor and enforce compliance with specific national environmental legislation, which includes uh, NEMBA and AIS regulations. We also investigate an act of omission in respect to which there is reasonable uh, suspicion that it may constitute an offense in terms of such a law or a uh, breach of such a law. Okay, fine. The criminal investigation powers. Okay, as EMIs, we are also referred to as peace officers or police officials. In terms of this section 31H, subsection 5 of NEMA, whereby we can exercise, we may exercise all the powers that are assigned to uh, police officials in terms of their Criminal Procedure Act, Chapter 2, 5, 7, and 8, which of which those powers are the powers to arrest. We have the powers to arrest, we have the powers to, to search, we have the powers to seize, and we also have the powers to issue the admission of guilt files. So all the grade one, two, and five EMS and five EMIs have the police official powers. Okay, compliance and enforcement. The inspections. We conduct inspections in terms of section 31K of NEMA to ascertain uh, compliance. What does this section say then? Because we have the powers. It says that um, the environmental management inspector within his or her mandate in terms of section 31D of NEMA may at any reasonable time conduct inspections and then they may, without a warrant, um, they may, without a warrant, inspect a property, a premise, uh, premises or land, or they may search um, any aircraft, any vessel, any vehicle, any item or a box in order to ascertain a compliance for the legislation of which they have been designated in terms of section 31D, and then they may also inspect a term or a condition of a permit or an authorization issued um, in terms of such a law. So, we will find people refusing um, the inspectors to conduct inspections and they'll be asking, why did you not make an appointment? But you can do that at any reasonable time because if now I start making appointments at all the nurseries or the pet shops and they you find that they, are, they have been selling those uh, listed in basic species without payments or, or just selling those ones that do not require a payment, obviously they will hide them. That is why we can just rock at any time. This gives us the powers to do that. And then we are not abusing the powers. We are not, because we find that the landowners are asking us, they are saying, oh, you guys are abusing the powers, and they don't, no, we're not doing that. Sometimes we receive complaints. Okay? And then administrative enforcement, what can we issue to non-compliance? We can issue the warning letters. We also issue compliance notice in terms of section 31L of NEMA. We do everything by the book. If I, uh, and then section 31, uh, L of NEMA says that um, um, a, a competent authority may, in writing, uh, 
Uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, we can issue notices. Uh, it says that an environmental management inspector may issue a directive in terms of section uh, 31D of NEMA, and that directive must be in a prescribed form and it must follow prescribed procedures. If there is a reasonable uh, grounds and a suspicion that uh, there is an offence or a legislation has been contravened, so you don't just issue. Okay. And then, uh, for purpose of uh, AIS, we have re the regulation, and Regulation 15 provides that directive in terms of Section 69, Subsection 2, and Section 73, Subsection 3 of Number B issued. So I will explain these two sections in the next slide. So. We go to criminal enforcement. As I said, um, we also do criminal. I'm also responsible for criminal enforcement. We open dockets um, with SAPS, and then we register the dockets, and then we hand the uh, we hand the dockets to NPA for decision of prosecution. They will decide whether they prosecute or not. If they prosecute, then the case will finally go to court for trial, and the court will decide. So the offences, in terms of section 101 of NEMBER, uh, which read a person is guilty of an offence if that person contravenes or fails to comply with the uh, provisions of section 65, subsection 1. This one talks about the alien species, whereby it says that a person um, may not uh, conduct a restricted activity involving a specimen of alien species without a permit being issued in terms of chapter 7. And then we have section 67, uh, subsection 1, if you contravene it, which, which says that the minister may, uh, by notice in the Gazette, publish a list of those alien species uh, of which a permit uh, in terms of section 65, subsection 1 of alien species it may not be issued. We, we may not get uh, uh, that payment. Okay? And then section 71, subsection 1, talks about the listed invasive species. And then a person may not carry out any restricted activity involving the listed invasive species without a permit. And then if you also contravene or fail to comply with the directive issued in terms of section 69, subsection 2, and section uh, 73, subsection uh, 3. It is an offense because this one says that um, uh, a competent authority in this regard, we're speaking about the, the, depart the department, ne? may issue a directive to a person that fails to comply with section 65, subsection 1. And then um, also section 67, subsection 2, and section 70, um, I mean 69, subsection 1. So you may be issued with a directive, okay? And then also section 73, subsection 3, if you fail to comply uh, with, with uh, section 71, subsection 1, which is the payment, for listed invasive species. And then the condition, you also fail to comply with the conditions of that payment, you all may also be issued with a, with a directive. Okay. And then if you also fail or um, you contravene section 69, subsection 1, or section 73, subsection 1, it is also an offense. Okay. And then, in this regard, for section 73, sorry about that, I don't know if you're getting, you're getting me or you're getting lost. <laughs> because there's a lot to explain here. Don't worry, that's why we have the question time. 
Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you also prudently alter any permit or you make false statement for the purpose of obtaining a permit or you forge any document for the purpose of passing it as a permit or uh, carrying a restricted activity without a permit, it is also an offence. So, section 73, subsection 1 uh, says that if you fail to comply with the, with the, with the conditions of a permit, it is also a, a criminal offence. Or if maybe you fail to comply with the directive, if you are issuing with the directive and you fail to comply with it, it's also an offence. Okay. The penalty is section 102 of member. It states that a person convicted of an offence is liable to a fine not exceeding 10 million, to imprisonment of a period not exceeding 10 years, or both such a fine and such an imprisonment. We also have penalties in terms of the regulation, of which the difference here of the money is five million, and then, uh, but then uh, for conviction, uh, okay, in case of second or sub subsequent conviction to a fine of ten million, uh, um, or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding ten years, or to both such a fine or such imprisonment. So I have a case study in 2016. Uh, Noah Art Pet Shop, I can disclose the name because uh, this has happened. Uh, in Peter Maris Bay, they were selling and they were in possession of the rosary uh, parakeet and then the compliance notice was issued and then um, obviously they were aware now because we issued a compliance notice and then the second inspection was done and then they were found now to be in possession of a different uh, species. This time it was the common boa, and then uh, the matter ended up in court. And then the Peter court charged the guy 50,000 rent, of which 20,000 was paid immediately, and 30,000 was spent or was suspended for three years. Which means if he was uh, after, within these three years, if he was found to be in possession of any listed invasive species, this uh, 30,000 rand was going to be imposed. And then the other one was drain pets in KZN. This was a complaint and then uh, the guy was sent with the information pack uh, to apply for category 2 listed invasive species and then he did not. So there was two follow-up inspections that were conducted and nothing was found. And then uh, the third inspection was conducted and now he was found selling the, the, the BMS python and then the turtles and, and the boa constrictor. And then he, instead of the matter going to court and then he, we entered into what we call a plea of admission of guilt of fine and then he pleaded guilty and then he was charged 20,000 rent because the guy was complaining that he does not have money but he hired a, an expensive lawyer <laughs> so, and then 10,000 was paid and 10,000 was suspended for five years meaning also meaning that if he, he is to be found selling the listed investment species the 10,000 will be imposed and then the other one is the Necessary. This one was in terms of the plans, and then the inspections were conducted, the notices were issued, and then it ended up in criminal, and then the accused admitted guilty. So he was sentenced to a fine of 15,000, and then 3,000 was paid with immediate effect, and then 12,000 was imposed, uh, it would be imposed if he was found to be um, in possession and selling the species within a period of three years. So it was suspended for three years also. So now this is, I don't know if this picture is clear, I just wanted to show you what we deal with at the nurseries. And you find that in this nursery, at the first inspection, uh, the inspectors found that um, there was only one plant of the um, of, of, of the listed invasive species, which is your your your, your teddy bear cactus, 
And then now I went back for a, I issued a notice, and then I went back for a follow-up inspection. So I found that this nursery has got about 10 different uh, uh, listed invasive species. There are still 10 different uh, listed invasive species, of which I did not include mostly here. So this was just a picture of uh, the plants that were found in this growing uh, area. This is Alice, Aliso, Aliso, which is the lost spine cactus. <laughs> I failed to pronounce this very well. I don't know why. Yeah. So, uh, in this case, I have drafted a final compliance notice of which I'm going to deliver at any time. It's one of the nurseries around South Africa. So, I cannot mention the name. So, now, yeah, this is my contribution. I'm saying that the alien and invasive plant species do not respect boundaries, so the landowners must work together with the department. And then the alien and invasive species are very gorgeous species that have detrimental impact on our natural resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our clients, questions? Questions, there we go. Then we'll the back. And they should stop calling those species such cute names like teddy bear cactus. Can I ask, has somebody been convicted? Has somebody actually enjoyed, okay, maybe not enjoyed, has somebody been convicted and had that uh, Is the notion of issuing fines um, a softer approach? Have you got enough teeth to actually convict somebody, send them to jail? Um, popular belief is that these men and ladies go up and down, up the side of the boat, up the side of the turtles, and maybe one or two sides down the line, and make up that fine again, back to square one. So, has somebody actually been convicted? Um. I think at my, in my, I've, okay, you say that the soft files and, and, and what I'm saying is that the court decides, we don't decide on the, on the, on the thing, or, or, or on the fines. If the court is saying 50,000, they, I don't, I, I, I can't actually explain a lot on what they look at, but then mostly they decide and then for imprisonment, um, if I go back, uh, to that slide where it talks about the the, 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 the the imprisonment, it says that it's either you are fined or you you you, you serve you you you, are in, you you will be in prison for such a time. So. You, it's either, then if you want to pay the fine, then it's fine. So if you don't pay the fine, it's obvious that they will have to, you have to go to jail. But then most of the times, the landowners, they, they, they opt for paying uh, the fines. So it, it is out of our hands, that one. I don't know if I've answered you well. Uh, Jock, you want to speak into the mic, please? I so say, in, in relation to the environmental and ecological impact, I mean, paying of fines, you know, the guys get away with it. I mean, let's face it, there's always going to be the option of, 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 of paying a fine, and the stats show 99% of those guilty parties pay fines, don't they? And the show goes on. Yes. Yeah. I think we need to we need to have that discussion with the prosecuting authorities. They need to understand the real implications of not impose small fines, which is beyond the context. But with that, we also would like to welcome John John Sidras, which is the president of the IRM, which is in town. Nice to see you here. Um, yeah. Yes. So Stian would like to also give an input with regards to that. Thanks. Um, just to answer your question, I think we've met before. Um, just, so, so Britta was also involved in one of, do you remember F1? 
Okay, so that is one of your big headaches in South Cape Town. At one, um, we actually filed a land expropriation without compensation for F1 and what happened there was the actual attorney against and I'm going to say the name of the Martin Kelly, the owner of F1 what happened that he actually auctioned that property, we took it away from him and we covered all the cost in removing any of the species and they actually as we speak busy King the Mountain we've spent about two, 2 million rand through some parks of making a fire break for that property while he was in Ireland but then we decided to take the property away from him to cover the rates taxes he owned to set up Cape Town and to make sure that the next owner will actually um, clear the property. So that is a, actually a good story to tell. And then we will remember one of our first um, projects around was North Lake Law that's bordering the, um, the National Park as well in Cape Town where that was a massive fire hazard. He then, we actually went there with Marie Louise and we had a big fight with him, but at the end of the day, we blocked his passport from leaving the country. He spent 3 million rand of killing his property, it's one of our success stories. So, they just, besides what they do in France, there's also, there's other things that we can do. I hope that helps a little bit. We have another question there from the gentleman. Back. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, I noticed that you mentioned a few businesses and I was interested to find out are there any private people that maybe uh, private homeowners that you guys have maybe find or is it only limited to maybe the people who distribute the invasive species? Okay, the private homeowners and uh, mostly we, they, it does not reached, it never reached uh, a stage of uh, the convictions because you find that we only issue the administrative uh, notice and they just and they comply. Okay, question here from the gentleman. So I think most people, once they've, once they've been written or, or issued a notice mm -hmm. and they are aware of the problem and look at the consequences, uh, they don't necessarily ignore it, but it is a time and process and it, and it, and it, it works. Just two questions. Uh, you mentioned that you as an imam, imams are allowed to visit a property at any reasonable time. Is that based on any sort of reasonable suspicion or evidence or anything like that? Do you have to have anything like that or can you literally rock up at any property and do an inspection? No, it's not because of any suspicion. Yeah, so you don't need any suspicion, any form of... of if there is a suspicion, we also come. Yeah, but okay, sometimes... But you don't need that, it's yeah. not required. Then my second question is, um, how do you guys identify yourselves when you do an inspection, uh, you know, un, okay. unscheduled inspection like that? Okay, we have environmental management inspectors cards, and then if you want to verify the card, oh, you don't have the new one, Okay, you can verify the card by taking out the card from uh, of all of this and check at the back if it has got details of the environmental management inspector and what gives you the powers to come and, and conduct uh, the inspection. So, so is there any number that we can call to verify? I'm just asking from a crime point of view because I mean that any random person can rock up at your property and then you guys need to have some sort of an identification to say you are who you are, EMI, so okay. you have that badge. Uh, is there any number to verify or anything, any further process we can verify a stranger coming onto your property that they are in fact who they say they are? Yes, you can call the Department of Forest and Fisheries and Environment. Obviously, if I come with the card and I tell you that I'm from the department, and then you can also check uh, the department's number, and if you want the EMI to provide you with one, they can provide you with one. But I would recommend that if you don't, if you're suspecting anything, you go onto the internet and check the, the number, because if those people are not EMIs, and then they can give you any number that um, that, that they are gonna call, and people will verify and say yes, they are. While they're not. Sorry, um, I just wanted to add to uh, what uh, my colleague alluded to that. Um, 
Manchester, um, and the time management inspectors will provide a, a DVD card um, upon arrival. Um, mainly the so called uh, routine inspection, where um, the inspectors will generally just visit without any notification, will be on a business um, a kind of a setup. Um, uh, on your private land, um, on your private um, residential uh, place, um, then that would mean that um, a warrant would have uh, been um, received or an appointment would generally um, have been made. Um, you don't just generally go to residential um, areas, but um, without any notification or without warrant. But for business like your nurseries, uh, pet shops, um, uh, as a business that is running on a day to day basis, we can, um, at any reasonable time, we can uh, visit those facilities. And um, yes, when we uh, uh, arrive at the premises, we still identify uh, ourselves and produce the identity card to those uh, facilities. Thank you. Sorry, just with regards to farm properties, is that seen as a business property or a private residence? How would you handle that? Yes, um, with farm uh, properties, we have got a challenge. Uh, but what we do, we um, ensure that we make appointment with um, farmers. The, the situation with farmers is completely different because um, of the setup, farming community itself. Um, you find the house is, um, um, let's say, a thousand or um, two kilometers away from the main entrance, and um, basically um, waste our resources to go around uh, farming where we don't know who we're going to need. So we need to basically, that, in that set up, we um, basically make appointment. And um, like she, um, indicated that um, the, the risk of risk in making appointment, the main risk is um, people hiding what um, uh, their, their, their illegal activities are. Uh, uh. So with um, farm farms, it's quite difficult to hide um, those, those um, whatever spaces that they might be dealing with. Yeah, but I just wanted to add on that in terms of the uh, properties. Is, okay, he say that uh, okay, we have to make appointments, but if I add that sometimes if I issue a final notice and then now I want to come for a for a follow up inspection and you've been telling me that you are clearing and you do not submit a control plan and I'm trying to make an appointment and you don't want, but I can still get a warrant. I can still get a warrant and come without an appointment and, and conduct an inspection. Uh, before the gentleman, I think it's important just to note that enforcement won't just arrive before you haven't received a notice of compliance. So it's not as if uh, the department will just arrive and start writing out fines. There is a process that goes on before that. Um, and I think that's important to note. So, you have a question? Yeah, it's just a suggestion. Do you only have some sort of a QR code that Please tell to verify that person on the card. Because I want to believe that if I happen to see your card, you are aware of that, you could register that your card is lost, and then I go to someone who has and they do QRs, and then at least you could have been registered that no, this card is not on the news. So that's my suggestion. I think that could be a cause your enemies. Most of the time, they do have that QR code. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's, a, there's a photo, there's a photo, there's a photo on your on your card to verify that you have a code on it. However, uh, there's also a number to find. Remember what, what she said with this with this logo on on her shirt and with a card. It's the same about as a policeman. That means if somebody rocks up with your property with 
where the person starts, it's actually a contribution of the law. You can't wear a police uniform without being a policeman. So if somebody comes to your property with this badge or a card and it's not right, there is a number on the card you can call and verify this. And, and, and also, part of this whole stakeholder agreement I'm firm we've got now is familiarize yourself with the EMIC area. So um, just raise your hands all for this area. Itani, you and, and, and you guys, all of you, raise your hands there. Show who's responsible for this area in Group of Day. There we so there we are, this is the people that is your area. Yes, obviously we might have people like myself or other people coming from Pretoria or Cape Town, but these are the people responsible as in us compliance in your area until Britta comes to you with something. Oh yes, more and you're rising up. <laughs> just, 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 just an acknowledgement maybe. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the, 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 the comment and input that came from my colleague and I will uh, think we should take that up. I don't know how the police cards are structured, uh, where they put that QR code, but it's something that we'll take up, we'll take it back and yeah. see that uh, if it's possible that it can be uh, factored in. Thank you, thank you a lot. Yeah. Very good suggestion, gentlemen, at the back. From Sammy. Thank you so much. You kept the same control plan, whether it's there or not. You come back, you find it. I got just curious to know, uh, in using Bible's or agents, this is one of the new problems of global change. You have a lot of uh, knowledge, use of chemicals, a lot of dynamics uh, tied to the development of the control plan. So I was just curious to know who belongs to the control plan because really it is some good science. That's number one. I'll give you an example of choice of chemical. I think someone needs to, I mean, talk about it earlier. And the context, why, why, what do you do, why, and what are the ecosystem goods and services they environment? Do you contaminate the air? Do you kill other plants? Who, 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 who develops this control plan for the farmer of the person who's in charge of this guy? Okay, it is the, the responsibility of the landowner, but in our directive, we indicate that um, a landowner must, um, actually, we must appoint an environmental uh, specialist. So obviously, if it's written by, it's developed by a knowledgeable person, uh, it, it will include almost everything that is required. And um, the, obviously, they will use the, uh, the the relevant methods and everything. And then we read the control plans before we approve it. So if there's something wrong with the control plan, we draft a letter indicating that this is not right and do not do one, two, three, one, two, three. And then please fix your control plan until it is um, according to the standard. I hope that helps. Let's see on to this. I'm gonna add. So, so yes, my colleague is absolutely correct. But before it gets to her, if you can, um, so we've, we've got our management plan and control plan. So management plan is for private property that you join up. The, 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 the monetary control and the education plan is for all organs of state. Okay, we've got guidelines that have been drafted. It's available for you and I can share that with you. Maybe once I can share that. If even a template of a management plan, I can share and what it should look like and what should be in there. We also, the department can also supply you with, for example, are there category one of these species that you would like to know how to maintain that we can guide you and we can help you and also DB will, will present a little bit later on all the heavy sites and types of chemicals you can and cannot use on certain species. So it's a small answer to that question, but control plans are Britta 100 percent right in saying if they send you a pre-director, they instruct you of how the control plan yeah. should look like, and in there we will check and verify if it's correct or not, and then we monitor it from there. Um, I think one of the people did ask earlier before we even started this day was about um, how do we go about that and if we go back to properties, yes we do. And um, once you've received a pre-director from Britta, which you do not want, then it becomes a legal document um, which needs to go through the whole process. But before that, we would name by saying the property a hectare and bigger should have a management plan of how to manage your properties of any of these species and we can help with that. We've got a template I can, I can guide you on that. Yeah. So it's not everything that has to go to 
uh, enforcement. And if you are a landowner and you have the, the listed invasive species in your property, you can notify the, uh, the relevant authority, which is the department. And then from there, uh, you will be required to draft a control plan and then submit it without any notice being issued. So if it's in, in, in the correct standard, uh, STIAN's team will approve it and, and then uh, they will be monitoring you accordingly. So it doesn't have to come to us, but if you deviate, uh, if, if you don't comply with the, uh, the control plan, that's when they will escalate the case to us, the matter. We have a question from the lady. But while we're waiting for the mic, we just reiterate because everybody gets confused sometimes. Ultimately, it is the land, uh, be it private or public, mm -hmm. to draw up the control plan. Exactly. Is that individual or organ of state's responsibility? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Bonte Mure. Um, my question is, if a management authority does have an AIS species, can it draft its own uh, management plan, a uh, control plan and approve that uh, control plan itself? The managing authority, which is the department, yes. if they have the listed investment species? Yes. Yes, they are the owner of the property. So they have to approve it because we will be coming with our own control. Who's gonna are you are you from the department? Yes. Okay. Yes, you have to draft um, the control plan and then we have to approve it from our section or steel section. Not not the the, the, the department itself. Uh, which department are you now referring to? I'm, I'm from this year. The steel oh yes. province. No, that's why I was not getting you. You will have to send the control plan to us, and then uh, the, our department will approve the control plan. Yes. So you can draw up your plan, but you can't approve your own no, plan. No, you can't. <laughs> I, wish we could, I wish we could all work out that way. It would make life very simple. <laughs> Even the, our own department, the DFFE, it's, it's within. We, it depends on the section. We will approve uh, the control plan for yeah. Do we have any any more questions? Or one one last one here before we break for tea, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Yeah, no, um I just want to know like as an ordinary citizen with no information about this basis. So um right now as I'm sitting here I'm just wondering, do I have one because I think I have something that looks like that? But then what kind of um, awareness um, do you do to like, um, the public in terms of this um, invasive species? Uh, there were awareness uh, uh, that were made in different um, campaigns in, in different provinces. But then uh, now when the inspectors come to conduct in, uh, inspections in your property, they also do some sort of awareness by explaining everything to you and ending awareness materials to you so that you become aware of the uh, of the legislation if maybe you have not been part of the awareness campaigns or you have not heard anything of the, about the listed invasive species. But social media is a wonderful platform for yeah. awareness and invasive species SA as we've been uh, broadcasting today. Um, just type in, just Google you know, invasive species within South Africa, and you will be amazed how much information is available to the general public. Um, not a crustal tax, unfortunately. Most work has been done on plant material, um, but more and more is coming all the time. So if you're not sure if you have one in your garden, it's very easy to go onto one of these forums, post a picture, and within a day or so, you will have people responding and saying, this is a problem, this is not a problem. So social media is really assisting us um, with creating a lot of awareness. Yeah, and, and, and if, as I explained, that if the inspectors come to your property, they make you aware. They will explain everything. So it will be up to you after the inspection, whether you apply, you apply for a permit or you, you draft a control plan. Yeah. Great. Question at the back, and then we'll wrap it up for tea. Okay, good morning, colleagues. I'm um, Sosa from the same department at Forest Branch. 
Thank you. 